Living Waters Community Church. Please join with us as we praise God this morning.
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.
one Sunday, there is no place that I'd rather be than right here in the Lord's house worshiping the Lord today. Father, in your word, it says, if my people would just humble themselves and seek your face. Yes. My God, my God, how true that is. God, we know that your word is true. We know that your word is love. We know that your word is compassion. Father, I just want to thank you for loving us, Father God. For sending your son, Lord, for your sacrifice, oh God. Even in our brokenness, Father God. Yes. My God, in our brokenness, Lord, you shower us with love and compassion, Lord. You see us, Father God, and we don't see ourselves. know what the road ahead is for us, Lord, even when we can't discern it, Lord. Father, I thank you for being the King of kings and the Lord of Lords. As we stand here today, Father, in your presence, seeking your face, seeking your presence, Father, that's what we're after, Lord. Nothing else will do, oh God. Some of us are standing here broken, God. Hearts decimated. Spirits just tired, God. Sickness in our bodies. Confusion in our minds, Lord. Deliverance needed in our lives, oh God. But we have the audacity to stand here like you don't know, God. The devil wants us to keep us from seeking you, oh God. He don't want us to lay it at your feet, Father, because he knows all we have to do is ask and lay it at your feet and believe that you are God. That you can fix it all. That you're in the fixing business, God. Whether it's hearts, relationships, minds, bodies, soul, you're in that business, God. But he wants to keep us quiet and keep us in our seats and keep us afraid and keep us from confessing it among men, oh God. But your spirit tells me today that you're here, oh God, and that you're ready to receive it, yes. that you're ready to fix it, that you're ready to make it right. All we have to do is just take that first step towards you, Lord. With every head bowed and Every eyes closed. If you're going through something today, if there's confusion in your mind about who you are, if there's confusion in your mind about your relationship with Christ, I just want you to slide your hand up right there where you are. Maybe there's confusion about who you are that you're seeking, trying to find out what God is calling you to be. Slide your hand up right there where you are. Thank you, thank you for being honest. Thank you for being open and ready for the Spirit to move in your life. Maybe you're dealing with sickness in your body. I say, slide your hand up right there where you are. Because our God is a healing God. Maybe you need deliverance from an addiction that you have. Oh my God. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's alcoholism. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's lying. Maybe it's gossiping. Oh my God. If that's you, just go ahead and slide your hand up. Nobody looking around. Thank you. Thank you so very much for being honest. Because you're not fooling God. He already knows. The word says if you're ready to confess it before God and before man. My God. We're going to pray for you today. And I am going to believe that whatever it is, whatever issue you're dealing with, whether if it's sickness, whether if it's confusion, whether if it's, if, it's, if it's your tongue that you're trying to get under control of your relationship with your husband and your wife, God can fix it right here today. I believe that. I stand on that. I'm going to ask you to come.
come, 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 come to the feet of the cross and let God begin to heal your life. Let him begin to restore your passion. Let him begin to restore your hunger for him. Let him begin to clear your mind and clear your heart so that you have clarity in who you are and who he's calling you to be. I say, come today. Let today be the first day and the last day, the last day of your past and the first day of your future with Christ. I say, come today. Don't you dare let the devil let you sit there and be quiet like you don't know what's going on. The house of grace, God's grace, the gospel of grace is now open. Come. As the psalmist finished this song, I say, come and let us pray for you. Let us lay hands on you. Let us lock our shields with you and stand as a wall of Christ against the enemy.
today, oh God. Let your love and your grace consume them, Lord. Put a hedge of protection around them and their families, Father God, because the enemy has no dominion over them, oh Lord. Let them walk upright in righteousness, Father God, because your son paid the price, oh Lord. Yes, that's right. Hallelujah. I plead the blood of Jesus over the lives of each and every one that's in the sound of my voice, oh Father God, that your grace may reign forever in their lives, oh Lord. Father, we magnify you, we glorify you, Father God, and we give you all the honor and glory. And the wonderful, the majestic, and the incredible, and the amazing name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are continuing in our study of the whole armor of God. Uh, we've looked at a number of pieces of this armor. Today we're going to look at another piece, and it's the helmet of salvation. We find this in a very brief passage. It's, it's Ephesians chapter 6, and just the first part of verse 17, and it just simply says, and take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever doubted your salvation? Have you ever doubted your salvation? Yes. You might be shocked to hear, but even your pastors sometimes doubt their own salvation. I know, I can't speak for Pastor Vance, but I know there have been times in the past, in the midst of doing what God has called me to do, that I wonder if, if I'm doing this and, and I'm not even saved myself. But I will tell you that God never wants us to doubt our salvation. In fact, the Bible tells us very clearly in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Listen, you need to know that you know that you know that you know that you have eternal life, that you have forgiveness of sin and assurance of salvation. But the enemy wants you to doubt your salvation. The enemy wants you to question your own salvation experience. Because if he can get you to question that, then he can shake the very foundations of all that you base yes. your faith upon. Yes. <clears throat> and I believe that this is the reason that the Apostle Paul chose to call the helmet that covers the head the helmet of salvation. Because you see, Pastor Vance outlined it very early on in this series, that the battlefield is in the mind. The battlefield is in the mind, and the enemy messes with our mind. And if we can put on this helmet of salvation that it covers our head to keep the headshots from the enemy from hitting us, and to protect us from that doubt that the enemy wants to place in our mind, then the enemy cannot have any inroads into our heart. Because he can't get it. He has to enter our heart through our mind. And if he can't get into our mind, then he can't get to our heart. And he can't get to that very sense of who we are in Christ. That's why I believe that That the Apostle Paul wrote also in Romans 12, 2. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Yes. And brothers and sisters, I would say that this is something that you have to do every single day. 
In, in fact, it's something that you might have to do several times a day, depending on what's going on in your life. Do not be conformed to this world. That's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to conform to the ways of this world. He says instead of doing that, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Again, this idea that, that what's going on in your head is where the action is with regard to the enemy's attacks against you. And so today I want to see there are numerous, no, there, there are a number of things that, that the helmet of salvation will protect us from, but I want to focus in on three that I think are common to many, many Christians. The helmet of salvation, I believe, will protect us first and foremost from a divided mind. From a divided mind. <clears throat> Listen. We live in a multitasking society. And we're capable, because God has created us this way, we're capable of doing more than one thing at a time. But let me ask you, are the multiple plans, the multiple things that we do each day, are they compatible with one another? In other words, is, is not one working against the other, or are they working in tandem towards a common goal? Because sometimes what we find ourselves doing, we get ourselves so involved in so many different things that we don't become good at any of them, and we find ourselves being ineffective overall yeah. in most of the things that we attempt to do. Or it may be that we're trying to have a dose of Jesus on the one hand, and a dose of the world over here, like that would make us well-rounded or something. But the reality is, is that a divided mind in James 1.8 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Yes. <clears throat> the story goes that there was a Civil War soldier who didn't know which side to fight for. So he wore a blue jacket and gray pants. And they found him dead on the battlefield, shot in the front and shot in the back. The problem is, is that when we try to, try to cover all the bases, all the bases in our life and try to be in the world, and we try to be like Christ, then we find ourselves dead on the battlefield because we haven't been successful in either world. Another story that I heard was Pope Alexander VII asked a Greek man once, why don't you become a priest? And the man said, well, because I might want to get married. And he said, well, why don't you get married? He said, because I might want to become a priest. You see, we can't live in both worlds. We've got to make a choice. We cannot ride the fence. We're either in or we're out. We're either hot or we're cold. We're either up or we're down. We cannot be all things in this world. Fence riding Christians are of no good to anybody. The enemy doesn't like you because you've got too much of God in you. And God doesn't really like it because you've got too much of the world in you. And in, in fact, in the, in the book of Revelation, he said, I would, I would just as soon spew you out of my mouth. I, I just, you make me sick. <laughs> you make me want to throw up, is the, is the paraphrase of that. If you're lukewarm, if you're double-minded, if you're a fence-riding Christian, you make God sick. You need to either be all in or say, be honest with yourself and with God and say, God, I really am not buying into what you're doing. And so I'm just going to live like the world, and I'm going to die and go to hell when that time comes. But I can't live my life in both worlds. I can't have a foot in the world and have a foot in the kingdom of God. I have to choose sides. Yes. We all have to choose sides. The helmet of salvation, I believe, will protect us from having a divided mind. It will help us to be able to say that we are all in, that we're all committed to the things of God. And that we're ready to do battle in God's kingdom. 
The second thing that I see the helmet of salvation protects us from is, um, is this idea of a deceived mind. Listen, Jesus gave up everything for me, and he deserves my best. <coughs> we put on the helmet of salvation because right thinking says, Jesus deserves my all. I wouldn't be here without him. I don't need to live my life focused on myself and worrying about things that are under uh, his control. Instead, I need to free up myself to serve the one who is sovereign over everything. But the devil wants to deceive our minds. So we jump from this and from that instead of moving forward in our faith. You may ask, well, how does Satan deceive our minds? I'm glad you asked. I want us to go all the way back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis yes. chapter 3. Yes. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, verse 2, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Did you catch that in that first verse? Please put the first one up again if you would. Satan, the serpent, said to the woman, did God actually say? Did God actually say? You see, he didn't deny God's word. He just caused Eve to cast doubt on God's word. Did he really say that? Is that what he really said? Are you sure? Are you sure that's what God said? Do you see how Satan is deceptive? And Adam and Eve were willing, listen to this, Adam and Eve were willing to give up literally everything because they believed the lie of Satan. They gave up everything. Do you understand what they had? Do you understand how good life was for them? We get the word paradise from Genesis. Because that's where they lived. They lived in a paradise. Everything in that place was good and nothing in that place was bad. There was no death. There was no pain. There was no evil. There was no hurt. There was no sorrow. There were no tears. Nothing bad ever happened in that place. It was designed by God for man to live forever in this beautiful, beautiful paradise. And they gave it all up. They gave it all away because they believed Satan's lie. They were sold out to Satan's deceit. But then Satan substitutes an outright lie in the place of God's word. Look at verse 4. It says, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. But you see, several thousand years later, we know the truth of that lie. We know the truth that, in fact, because they ate of that fruit from that tree, that they did die. That death came in to their world. That evil came into their world. That, that, that sickness and disease came into that world. That pain and sorrow came into that world. All of the things that we despise in this world today came into that world because they believed a lie. They fell for it. And Satan, brothers and sisters, is still in the business of lying to you. Making the things of this world that we know we should not have any part of look so good and so tempting. They make us want to have it so badly. He's 
the best advertiser in the world because he makes you think that you cannot live without it. And listen, there are whole groups and organizations that have bought into the lie. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you know the answer to this, you can answer it. Who owns the largest printing press in religion today? You know? They, this, this company puts out 500 pieces of literature per second. I'll give you a hint. One of them, came, a couple of them came to my door a couple of days ago. The Jehovah's Witness, who although deceived and diluted, are totally sold out to their cause. If, if, if they come to your door, you're going to know that they know what they're talking about. It's not true, but they're going to believe with every fiber of their being that it is true. They have believed a lie. Let me give you another example. Who is it that knocks on doors an estimated 500 hours before they, they see a single convert, and yet they're starting one new church per day all around the world. Do you know who that is? The Mormon church. Because even though they are deceived, they are totally sold out for their cause. And you know why these groups are growing and Christianity is declining? It's because you and I, brothers and sisters, can't decide which world we want to live in. And we have become deceived by the enemy. We have been lulled asleep by the enemy. And we believe that it is important to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we don't have to do it today. We can get around to that someday. We don't have to be verbal about our faith. We just have to live our faith and we don't ever have to say anything and people will somehow catch salvation from the things that we do. Brothers and sisters, if you think that, then you have bought into a lie because the Bible tells us that we need to be about the Father's business and the Father's business is bringing good news and hope to a lost and dying world. The helmet of salvation will protect you from a deceived mind. The third thing that I believe that the helmet of salvation protects us from is from a discouraged mind. A discouraged mind. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now it's interesting that here, in this passage, the word hope is added to the description of the helmet. It isn't just the helmet of salvation, but it is the hel but it is a helmet for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For you see, brothers and sisters, hope in the Bible isn't wishful thinking. I believe that the biblical definition of hope is an unwavering confidence in God. And it is hope that we have already found and we have already received. And because of that, then we can know that we 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 know that, we know that Christ is Lord of our lives and we live our lives and, and live out our lives in that knowledge and understanding. I will tell you that when a soldier loses hope on a battlefield, he's lost the battle. When you give up, when you give in, you lose. And if you do, you might as well throw in the towel and surrender because as Christians, remember we don't fight for victory, but we fight from victory. We fight from a position of victory. Victory isn't something that comes from without, it comes from within. It's something that we already have inside of us. It's a hope that we have inside of us. And because of that, we, we, don't, 
We don't worry about the things that we have no control over. We don't fret about the things that we can't control. Instead, we live out the, from the things that we know, and that is that but we can stand with confidence, believing that what God said He would do, that He will do, because God is not a man that He should lie. Yes, yes, yes. If God said it, my brother does this every time he preaches, if God said it, that settles it. I believe it, and that settles it. It's not a question. There's no question mark in any of that stuff. Did God say it? Should I believe it? No. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. It's done. And we can just stand there having this helmet of salvation guarding us from the enemy. And we can even taunt the enemy. Come on, Satan, give us your best shot. Go ahead, right here. It ain't going to go through because I have the helmet of salvation. I know that I am protected from you and from your evil thoughts and deeds. I love this. I, I was reading a story the other day, and, and it, it was a story of a general. And, and these words, he uttered these words to his troops. He said, men, we are completely surrounded by the enemy. Don't let even one of them get away. <laughs> Do you ever feel like you're surrounded by the enemy? Don't let one of them get away. We have a captive audience. They're right there. We can reach out and touch them. Don't let any of them get away. See, that's the difference between having hope and having no hope. And that's the attitude that Christian soldiers should have. With our minds guarded by the helmet of salvation. When you Listen, when you see a Christian give up, you can know that that decision was preceded by some wrong thinking. Something like this. Ain't no use praying. It don't do no good anyway. Sorry for the grammar. But honestly, when you look around, Christians are giving up. They're giving up all over the place. We're surrendering the high ground everywhere we look. We're ceding over to the enemy. Christians are giving up going to church. Christians are giving up giving to the, to, the, to the work of Christ. Christians are even giving up inviting people to come to church. And, and Christians have given up on becoming equipped, becoming disciple in the things of God. You know, when we look around this room and we can count the numbers and we look who's here on Sunday morning for our Bible study, it's a very small number compared to the big crowd. It's because most of us feel like that, that there's no use in coming and learning the things of God and learning how to be better equipped in our faith. We've given that up. Listen, one day in heaven, one day in heaven, we will trade this helmet of salvation for a crown of righteousness. Will it go on our head? Maybe, but not for long because what I read is that we will take off our crowns and we will lay them at the feet of Jesus, the one who has done for us what we could not do for ourselves, and that is defeat the enemy totally and completely. Listen, when Jesus was dying on the cross and he said, it is finished, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, the enemy clapped out loud and he said, I've done it. And Jesus said, checkmate. <laughs> and someday we're going to take off this helmet of salvation and we're going to replace it with this, with this crown of righteousness. But then we'll quickly take it off and lay it at Jesus' feet because he's the one who has ultimately defeated the enemy for us. He's already a defeated foe. And because of that, as we said, we fight from victory, not for victory. Yes. And when we fight from victory, that's a whole different perch. Then when you're fighting to win, you're just fighting. This is called mopping up operations. That's what that's called. It's just going and getting these little skirmishes that are going on in the world. We already won the war, you know. In World War II, 
The enemies, the enemies surrendered. But the word didn't get out everywhere and there were still battles that were going on even though the enemy had already surrendered. Until the news got there. Guess what? We need to be carriers of good news. We need to be telling the world, hey, you don't have to fight this enemy any longer. Jesus Christ has already won this battle. All we've got to do is receive that and then we can stand in victory because Christ has won. Yes. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. Then you need to start living like you believe it. Yes. You need to start living like you believe it. Because I will tell you that a lot of people call themselves Christians. And, and I don't want to be associated with them because it gives Christianity a bad name. I'm not trying to be crude. I'm not trying to be ugly, but I'm trying to be real. As Pastor Van said, I'm trying to keep it 100. Absolutely. Listen, we've got to start living like we believe what Christ has done really happened. We need, to quit. we need to quit living like atheists, like Christian atheists. Believing that, well, you know, I call myself a Christian, but I really don't believe any of that junk. You've got to believe it. And if you believe it, then you've got to start living like it. So let's take the helmet of salvation. Yes. Take the helmet. You, look, if you don't wear it, it's not going to protect you. And so you need to go to the supply room and you need to get all your equipment. And when they lay this helmet of salvation up on the counter, you need to take the helmet of salvation. And then you need to put it on and you need to defeat the enemy. Because guess what? He's already defeated. All you've got to do is just inform him of being defeated. What are you fighting before you're already defeated? Get out of here. Satan. Ready for this? Would you like to see Satan? He's under my foot. Look, there he is right there. Smashed. <laughs> Satan is under my feet. He is a defeated foe, and you and I, brothers and sisters, stand in victory because Christ has already won the battle. Let's live like we believe it. Let's live like we mean it. Let's live in victory. Let's put on the helmet of salvation and all the other pieces of the full armor of God and let's stand ready to do battle in spiritual war. With one.